Good, good evening. Good to see everyone out tonight. Hope you all had a fine afternoon. I was able to go home and get a nap. So it's me. That was a very great Sunday afternoon. Tonight, I want to talk to you about things that we are willing to give up our eternal inheritance for in a lesson entitled The Price for Stew, turning our text to Hebrews chapter 12, 14 to 17. And I, I could actually turn there with me. Unlike this morning where we looked at the text close to the end, we're going to start with our text here in Hebrews chapter 12. And as you're turning there, I want you to be thinking of some things that the Hebrew writer has been building up to this point. The book of Hebrews itself is a plea for Christians to remain faithful to Jesus Christ and establishes certain things about him. In Hebrews 2, 1 to 3, we're told not to drift away from it. So, contrary to many popular doctrines that are around the world today, it is possible to drift away. We need to be careful that we not let it happen to us. In Hebrews chapter 10, 26 to 31, a Christian who turns away, he says, he does so willfully, having had the knowledge of the truth, he, he sins willfully. If he does that, he's guilty of trampling underfoot the Son of God. He's guilty of disregarding the blood that cleanses us or ca calling it unclean. And he's guilty of insulting the Spirit of grace. And so as Christians, we need to be careful about walking back into the world, about giving up our salvation. In Hebrews 10, 38 to 39, the, the Hebrew writer exhorts the Christians there not to be those that turn back. He said they were suffering certain things, going back to verse 32 of Hebrews 10. He said for having done nothing else wrong but being Christians, they, they had their property seized, they were imprisoned, and he said they, they endured that joyfully. But they must have had, there must have been something that the writer knew about, that they were about to give it up because he said now is not the time to throw away your confidence. Now is the time for endurance. And then he quotes from Habakkuk, that God has no pleasure in those that turn back, but delights in those who have the pres preservation of their souls through their faith. In Hebrews chapter 12, 1 to 3, we're told that Jesus suffered on the cross so that we might have victory through him, and that from his example, we might not grow weary and lose heart. That Jesus did everything for the joy set before him, and that joy set before him was for you and for me. Again, as we talked about this morning, that we can make that sacrifice on an individual and personal level. Again, that individual and personal level is that Jesus Christ did it for you and for me so that we do not grow weary and lose heart. But we need to understand from all these passages that there is a danger that one may fall short of God's grace. They might fall away. The Corinthians were admonished to take heed lest they fall in 1 Corinthians 10, 12. The, Paul, writing to the Corinthians in this particular example, was using Israel, they were God's people, using their example that no matter how much God was in their midst, he was in their presence, and yet they continually fell. They continually sinned. He says they need to take heed lest they fall. Some of the Galatians had fallen from grace in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 4. And Paul says, I'm amazed at you, you who were running so well, who bewitched you? Now, who, who hindered you from obedience to the truth? In the first part of Galatians 5, and in, in, going back to Galatians 3. Well, there is an example in the Old Testament that the New Testament writer here draws on in Hebrews chapter 12, 14 to 17, that was a great example of this, who had everything from a physical standpoint and threw it all away. And that is the case of Esau. And the case of Esau is used as a warning for Christians to be strong in the faith, to not cast it all aside. And so read with me in Hebrews 12, 14 through 17. Hebrews chapter 12, 14 through 17. He says, Pursue peace with all men, and a sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled, that there be no immoral or godless person like Esau, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. So this brings us back to a time of, of the patriarchs. This brings us back to Genesis chapter 25, 29 to 34. We need to remember a few things about Esau. Remember, he was the oldest of the twins. He and Jacob were twins. Jacob was seen grabbing out, grabbing at his heel, and 
Jacob's name means usurper, so Jacob was aptly named. Esau is the oldest of the twins, and as the oldest, he was entitled to the birthright. He was a hunter. He came in the field fam he came in from the field famished. And he finds Jacob had a pot of lentil stew cooking. And what we see is Esau asked for a bowl of it. Now he came in out of the field, he's famished. That tells me maybe he wasn't as successful as other times, or perhaps he wasn't, he didn't have time to cook it. And Jacob's already got something prepared. But he says he's famished, he's to the point of dying, and Jacob set the price for lentil stew at his birthright. That's what Jacob said. Jacob said, you want a bowl of my stew? The price is your birthright. Esau accepted that price. That is a hefty, hefty price for one single meal. But Esau said, I'm dying, so what use is my birthright? I can't use it if I die from hunger, if I starve. Do you think he would have starved from that point to when he got home? I, I highly doubt it. And anything's possible. But he felt, that's how he felt. How many times do we use that phrase? I'm starving to death. You know, I'm so hungry. Are we really starving to death? Maybe not at that particular point in life, right? But we all have been there. We've all said that. I'm starving to death. Feed me. Well, that's what he's saying to Jacob. And Jacob, this isn't a very brotherly act for the younger brother to say, yeah, give me your birthright. But have you ever gone to a, a restaurant or especially fast food and they say, would you like fries with that? You know, Jacob dangles something else in front of him. Jangle, J Jacob's dangling bread. He didn't ask for bread. He, he asked for a bowl. Jacob's going to even throw in bread, as you'll see. But Esau sold his birthright. That is his physical inheritance for a bowl of stew. The sad thing about that is we might be able to laugh and kind of make fun of Esau in our own way. Is many Christians accept that price. For the price of stew, and that stew is whatever it is we desire, is worth throwing away our eternal inheritance. And Christians make that, that price, they make that deal all the time. I want to talk about Esau from the standpoint that he was an heir of Isaac. Esau and Jacob were Abraham's grandsons. They were the, the grandsons of the heir of promise, of Isaac. And so they, they were Abraham's grandsons. They're heirs of their father Isaac. Esau was the older of the twins. If you go back to Genesis 25, 20 through 26, the accounting of their birth. And the birthright meant a lot. The birthright meant one would become head of the family at the father's death. The birthright meant one would receive a double portion of his father's possessions. The birthright meant one would take the lead in worship at the father's death. So these three things were grave responsibilities placed upon the person that received the birthright from their father. They received the double portion of all the possessions. This could imagine why, from a covetous standpoint, why the younger brothers, the younger siblings, might really covet the father's birthright. And why Jacob might have said, yeah, I'll give you a bowl of stew for your birthright, right? He understood the importance of that birthright and was willing to make a deal for it. Esau, we're going to be told later, despised the birthright, means it didn't mean anything to him at the time. And he was starving to death anyway, so what use was it going to be? And he sells it for a bowl of lentil stew. You know, every time I've read that, I said, you know, it wasn't even beef stew. <laughs> it wasn't even clam chowder. That's what I like. I like clam chowder. Or split pea soup. That's one of my favorites. It wasn't even split pea soup with ham in it. It was lentil stew. That means it's beans. And he was willing to sell that and make that deal. The birthright could be traded... And it could be sold, as Jacob and Esau are making this deal. We can see that. Jacob even threw in bread. You know, many. If you go to back to Genesis 25, 29 to 34, we're going to read this account. And notice how Jacob even sweetens the deal. When Jacob had cooked stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was famished. And Esau said to Jacob, Please, let me have a swallow of that red stuff there, for I am famished. Therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said... First, sell me your birthright. Esau said, Behold, I'm about to die. So what, have you, what use then is the birthright to me? And Jacob said, First swear to me. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew. And he ate and drank and rose and went on his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. <clears throat> it meant very little to him. 
That's why that's what it means when it says he despised it. He was willing to trade it away for a bowl of soup and some bread. Jacob really wanted it. Jacob put great value on it and wanted it badly enough to do a non-brotherly thing and charge his brother for a bowl of soup. But his brother was willing to pay the price because we're told Esau despised his birthright. So it was of little cost to him to give away because it's not something that he valued, right? But it meant a great deal to Jacob. There in Genesis 25, 34, where it says Esau despised his birthright. Esau is called godless over in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 16. Esau is called godless. He lived only for the present. I want you to think about this. He did not trust in God. Where was his faith and trust in God that God was going to allow him to die right then and there? And that his birthright would be of no use to him? Where was his faith? Where was his trust? We don't see it. In Genesis 25, 34, he despised it. Hebrews 12 and verse 16, if you're still there with me. In verse 16, it says that there be no immoral or godless person like Esau. Esau is described as immoral and godless. And saints are warned to not let there be any among them that rise up that are immoral and godless men like Esau. Someone that thinks so little of the eternal inheritance that they have possessed as being children of God that they're willing to trade it for something temporal in passing. Saints are warned to not let there arise among them men like Esau. Why? Because Esau sold his birthright for a single meal and he serves as warning to us today. So after talking about Esau and what he gave up physically, what he was willing to give up for something temporal in passing, was this meal going to fill him up forever? No, he's going to be hungry the next day at breakfast or lunch or dinner or whatever the next time it is to eat, right? This was not going, this was not a magical bowl of lentil soup that was going to fill him up forever. It was something temporal, it was something passing. And we, as the Hebrew writer says, he regretted it. But the deal was done, and it was too late. So let's talk about us as heirs of God. Christians have the honor of being called sons of God. Look over with me in first Peter in first John, I said first Peter. First John three, one to two. In first John chapter three, one to two. John, writing through the Spirit, says, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know when He appears we'll be like Him, because we'll see Him just as He is. So Christians have the honor of being called the sons of the children of God. We have the love of the Father bestowed on us, so that he would call us his sons and his daughters. And as children of God, there are some blessings that come in that. We are heirs of God as Christians. Romans 8, 14 to 17 bears this out, as many other places do as well. But at Romans 8, 14 begins, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of slavery, leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, and here's where the blessing part comes in, if we're children, heirs also, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so we may also be glorified with him. I want you to think about that. Where is Christ now? We talked briefly this morning about all the many different passages that say he sits at the right hand of God. Stephen, as he was being stoned at the end of chapter 7, saw him standing at the right hand of God. Right? That's where Jesus is in heaven. Colossians 3 says that's why Christians need to focus not on things of earth, but focus on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Colossians 3, 1 to 3 tells us he's seated at the right hand of God in heaven. So where's our inheritance? In heaven. We're made fellow heirs with Christ. And that's why he was able to tell his disciples in John 14, I'm going away to prepare a home for you, and I'm going to come back one day and get you so that you'll always be with me there. We can cry out to God as our Father, as Christ did in the Garden of Gethsemane. In Mark 14, 36, it's recorded, Jesus said, Abba, Father. Abba in the Greek it's not, it doesn't have any special meaning other than a term of endearment, a 
of intimacy. So <clears throat> you might call your dad, daddy, papa. When I was growing up, my, my father to us was papa. I still, when I call him, he's my papa. And my cell phone, his, his contact information says papa cell. <laughs> he's, he's my papa. And when I would refer to him as my dad, was to others, he was my dad, but when I addressed him, he was Papa. Abba, Father, Abba was Greek for Daddy or Papa. It's this close, personal, intimate relationship that we have, that we can see Christ had. Here, Paul makes the point, we can cry out to him, Abba, Father, the same as Jesus did. That's how strong this adoption is that makes us part of his household. And as part of his household, there's... We are made his fellow heirs with his son. If heirs, that means there's an inheritance. That has caused throughout time, an inheritance has caused all kinds of difficulty among siblings, has it not? My, just as a personal standpoint, my, my family on my mother's side, <clears throat> her father passed away in the late 80s, and his land, the matter of his land and possessions is still not settled. Because there were so many of them. There were about 19. And then five more came out of the woodwork. So <laughs> there's, there's a big legal battle that's been going on since at least 1991 over my grandfather's things. Because the, the, the children can't come to an agreement as to how the will ought to have been interpreted. And inheritance causes a lot of strife sometimes. Because of covetousness. Because people want things. And so we find that an inheritance is a big deal. But when we talk about heirs, it means there's an inheritance that those heirs are going to receive. right? And so we need to talk of, as Christians, as heirs of God, and Christians have an inheritance. Look in 1 Peter chapter 1. If understanding what fellow heirs with Christ isn't enough, Peter spells it out for us in 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. All the passages telling us where Christ is, the house that he went to go build, that he's going to bring back, we can all infer from all of that what our inheritance is. But Peter doesn't leave it up to our imagination or to our deductive reasoning powers. He tells us what it is. In 1 Peter 1, starting in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Christians have an inheritance. That inheritance isn't something that's going to perish. It's not something that's going to fade away. It's an eternal inheritance, and it's in heaven reserved for us. You know what that means? Never faded away. That means it cannot... It cannot go away. It can't be stolen. It cannot be destroyed. But you know what it can be? It can be traded or sold. Right? It can be traded or sold just as Esau sold his. That's why the Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 12 warned Christians not to be like Esau and to give it up for anything. Nothing on earth is worth that price. Christians have the promise that all things will work together for their good, for those who love him in Romans 8 and verse 28. Christians have the promise of eternal life. John 14, 15 tells us that to love him is to obey him. So those who have this promise that he will work all things for their good isn't just for anybody in the world. It's for those who have obeyed him. It's for those who have put him on in baptism. Christians have the promise of eternal life. 1 John 2 and verse 25, John says, This is the promise which he himself made to us, eternal life. That too is a blessing and an inheritance. Titus 1, 1 to 2 tells us God has promised it, and it will come to pass because God cannot lie. Christians are in the same position as Esau was, from an eternal standpoint, to inherit all the blessings of their father. Esau stood to inherit all that Isaac had gained from Abraham. All that Isaac possessed, he would gain a double portion. As Christians, we stand to inherit the blessings that God has promised to us. Eternal life, a home in heaven where he is, we will be in his presence. He will always be there. But then coming back to Hebrews chapter 12, we need to talk about the price for stew. 
With so much to inherit in the physical, Esau asked, what is the price for stew? Genesis 25, 32. Hebrews 12 and verse 16 tells us he sold it for a single meal. With so much to inherit for eternity, why do Christians sometimes ask, what is the price for stew? 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10. Look over there with me. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. For students of the Bible, by the time you get to this passage, you don't wonder who this man is we're going to read about. We've seen him in two other places. We've seen him in Philippians 1.24 and Colossians 4 verse 14. But in verse 9 it says, Make every effort to come to me soon. For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. You look in Philippians 1.24 and Colossians 4 and verse 14, and Demas is listed as fellow workers with the Apostle Paul. In fact, he's referred to at one point as his fellow worker. So he had worked, he had labored in the field for the gospel with Paul. He had seen the firsthand the sufferings and the persecutions that arose on the Paul because of the word of God. But he had also seen the great blessings and the power of the transforming power of the gospel as he saw people turn from their idolatry and their pagan lives to serve the one true God. But it tells us he loved this present world and deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Some have told me that doesn't mean he, he deserted the faith. It just means he, diver, he deserted Paul. Now, Paul kind of gives us the hint of where his priorities were. It was no longer with laboring for the gospel. It says he loved this present world. We can go to 1 John chapter 2, 15 to 17, that we're not to love the world or the things in the world because it's set for perishing. It's set, it's set for fire, for burning. First Peter chapter or Second Peter chapter three. Demas set the price for stew. He was willing to give away all that he had as the blessings of being a fellow worker with Paul and in the and in the kingdom, because he loved the present world. The present world was his stew, and he paid the price for it. Matthew thirteen twenty through twenty three, and Matthew chapter thirteen twenty through twenty three. Jesus describes the rocky and thorny soil Christian. He says of the rocky soil that they didn't have any firm roots. So when trials and persecutions, not just the storms of life in general, but it says because of the word, meaning they were targets because they were Christians, they immediately fell away because they had no firm root. They didn't ground themselves in God's word. They didn't trust in him. Isn't that what Esau did? I'm dying. What good is it to me now if I die? And so he sold it. He didn't have a firm trust in God. Jesus describes the thorny soil Christian as those who are so concerned with the deceitful, deceitful riches of the world, the pleasures of this life, that they allow them to choke the word out and it says they become unfruitful. Unfruitful. What did they trade their inheritance away for? whether relief from temptation and persecution, whether because they liked riches or their cares of this world got, got the better of them, that became their stew that they were willing to trade their, inherit, their eternal inheritance for. Some may sell or trade their spiritual birthright for the pleasures of this life, as we just described in the parable of the sower. Luke chapter 8, verse 14, the way that Luke passage puts it, the riches and pleasures of this life, some allow these things to choke out the word of God in their lives. The deceitfulness of wealth, the pleasures of this life and riches become their stew. That's what they must have right now and they're willing to trade their eternal inheritance for. Some, it's for the love of money. 1 Timothy 6, 10 to 11. Notice that it's not just money. Money in and of itself is not either evil or good. You can set out your cash or coins on a table and they're not going to run around and do things that are disgraceful to talk about. They're not going to run around and do good things that you're going to brag about. Your money is an inanimate object. Notice the cause here is the love of money. That's what's being talked about here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, 10 to 11. He says the love of money has caused some to sell their inheritance for the pursuit of it and material wealth. He said some falling away from the faith pursued riches to the destruction and ruin of themselves and their families and their faith. Friendship with the world. 
James chapter 4 and verse 4. Those who compromise with the world, that friendship, whatever that whatever package that comes in, their co-workers, their friends, their family, the people that they don't want to offend. I can't offend friends or family. It's an excuse I have heard so many times. I had to do this. I had to do that because I couldn't offend. You've chosen your stew. And you treated something far more valuable for something passing and temporal. Those who compromise with the world, it says, makes themselves enemies of God. That's a heavy price to pay for that stew. The lust of the flesh, 1 John 2, 15-17. Some may exchange the peace, the hope, and the purpose of the Christian life for the pursuit of the lust of the flesh and all that that contains. Ephesians chapter 4 describes the Gentile walk of life, that they run the immoral, immoralness with greediness. They run the immorality with greediness. There are many saints that do the same thing. That becomes their stew. And they're willing to give away, to sell, to trade their internal inheritance for something passing and temporal. Christians who give up their eternal rewards for the temporal passing pleasures of life have sold their inheritance for stew. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25, we need to recognize that we need to be like Moses. Moses saw the passing pleasures of sin. He saw what it meant, and so he despised being called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And he cast his lot in instead to suffer with God's people, because he saw an eternal reward there, something that was not passing, something that would never fade away, that would never be destroyed or stolen. We need to be like Moses and recognize sin for what it is, the passing pleasures. It's not temp it is not eternal. They are temporal. They will fade away and we're going to be left with guilt, sometimes depression over what we have done. So as we conclude, and looking in Hebrews chapter 12, we can see Esau sold his inheritance for a single meal, something that would only last the moment. That's what the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 12, 16. It was a single meal. We're also told he later regretted it, but it was too late. Once Isaac had spoken, there was no change. And we can go back and look and see how Jacob got that blessing from his father through deceit and the, the deceitfulness of his mother. But it was rightfully his because Esau had sold it to him. Isaac just must not have been in the know. <laughs> and while that's not right the way it was obtained, once Isaac spoke, there was no change. And we see Esau through tears before his father saying, don't you have anything left for me? And he says, no, I gave it all to your brother. It's done. He couldn't take it back. It was done. Hebrews 12, 17 says he regretted it so much, he desired it, and he sought after it with much tears. And because of this inheritance, it, just, it divided this family too. He vowed he would kill his brother Jacob. And Jacob had to leave his family and go on the run from his brother. And it was nearly 20 years later before he would have he would see Esau again. And he still feared him. But yet we see this beautiful reconciliation that happened after 20 years. So we're not told how long Esau sought after it. But the Hebrew writer says he sought after it with much tears. But it was too late. The judgment was set. And the Hebrew writer refers to him as immoral and godless. However, there are Christians who sell their inheritance, and they regret it. Through repentance, they can get it back in this life because it's not something physical. It is eternal. James 5, 19 and 20 says, One who is turned away can be turned back. 1 John 1, 9 says, The one that confesses sin and asks for forgiveness will be forgiven. God will forgive them. However, if a Christian is found on the judgment day, having sold their inheritance and not returned, regained it through repentance, there will be no change. There will be no second chance because like Isaac, once God has spoken, there will be no change. 2 Corinthians 5.10 tells us, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, 
whether good or bad. Revelation 20, verse 15 says, We must be written in the book of life. Of all the things for our name to be recorded in, that's where we must desire our name to be recorded in for all eternity. We must desire that and do everything that we can for our name to be enrolled in heaven. The price for stew man might be willing to pay is the inheritance of heaven. And think about the reasons today. Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3 that there's going to be mockers in the last days saying, where is his promise? All things have continued since the day of creation. Everything's been going on just as it has from the beginning. How easy it is to say, where's the promise of God? I'm not doing anything with it right now. I might as well enjoy life to the fullest and fill in the blanks, whatever that stew might be. They're willing to trade that eternal inheritance to sell it for something passing. The price for stew, then, for worldly pleasures, fill in the blanks, whatever it is, is hell. Matthew 25, 41 and verse 46. As he parts those from the righteous to their right and the wicked to his left, he says to those on his left in verse 41, Depart from me, you accursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. This reminds us of his language going back to Matthew chapter 7, 21 and 23, where he says, Depart from me, I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. Verse 46 describes it as eternal punishment. Those who sold their internal inheritance will find themselves parted on Jesus' left if they have not repented of it. And it will be too late. And the price for their stew ultimately will be an eternity in hell. And I would tell you that price is too steep. And it's not worth the price that we think that it might be for that temporal passing moment. Esau sold his inheritance for a bowl of lentil stew. Genesis 25, 34. Jesus once asked in Matthew 16, verse 26, What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Will you, will you be like Esau and name the price for your stew? Something that's passing, something that's temporal, something that you'll later regret. What is your stew? What are you willing to give up your inheritance for? That's another way to ask that. What are you willing to give up your eternal inheritance for? And I'm going to tell you it's not worth the price. Don't pay it. Because it's not worth the price when we hear the, the, that condemnation from God. When we hear our, our Savior, the one that died, the buy and wash those sins away. Say, depart from me, I never knew you. Depart from me into the eternal fire. It's not worth the price. Tonight, if you are a Christian and you've not been living the way that you should, I want you to ask yourself, whatever sin it is, and we all have been there, we all know there's that one sin, that one vice, we justify and we justify, we pet it and we take care of it, and we say, this is the sin I'm not willing to give up. If that's you, it's not worth the price. You need to get rid of that. Ask yourself, is it worth my soul? Tonight, if you're not a Christian, you need to ask yourself, the life that you're living, is it worth your soul? You can repent. You can be baptized, rising from the waters in newness of life. If we can assist you in any of, any of these things, if you're subject to an invitation in any way, come forward and let it be known now while we stand and while we